Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Ramiumptum Ruminations. My name is Scott, and I'm the host. Today's episode is called The Devil of the New Testament. Thanks again for coming back to listen to another episode. Today's discussion will build upon the last few episodes. So the two episodes ago, episode 74, I I brought on Kaisa Berlin Kaufusi, and we discussed a real like a general overview of the different versions of Satan that are out there. Last week, I discussed some of the earliest iterations, the earliest versions of the devil that are in the Old Testament. And this week, we're going to finish this this, uh, series of discussions by focusing on the the devil in the New Testament. And we'll discuss a little bit about how the theology shifted in between the time when the books of the Old Testament were finished and then uh, the writing of the New Testament and then some important books in between that uh, heavily influenced the writers of of the new testament i haven't done it in a while so i'm going to throw in a shameless self-plug if this podcast is something that you enjoy and you're financially able please consider becoming a monthly recurring donor to the podcast by going to ramiumptumruminations.org and clicking that donate button on the side i would greatly appreciate it i appreciate anything that you can offer If it's not something that you're financially able to do, please consider liking it, subscribing to it, leaving a review on whatever podcast streaming app that you're using, and sharing it with family and friends. For today's uh, discussion, much of what I'm pulling from is from a book called The Satan by Ryan E. Stokes. I'll have that uh, cited in the show notes. And I I gave a, a brief description of Ryan's background in the previous episode. Between the time where the last book of the Old Testament was written and the first book of the New Testament was written, there was a number of apocryphal books that did not make it into the canon that were written and circulated around that time that heavily influenced the way people viewed sin and evil and the devil and demons and their influence on people. And the two books that I'm going to briefly discuss are the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch. And they had Uh, vastly different views of the role that demons or that a Satan figure played in the theology. In the book of Jubilees, the source of evil is put onto demons and other evil, superhuman, supernatural beings. The, uh, The source of all immorality is put firmly in the hands of these superhuman creatures. We left off last week with the story of Job and the shifts in theology that that story had where Satan, the Satan figure in the story of Job, is depicted as attacking righteous people, not just unrighteous people, where the earliest iterations of the Satan as a title of a superhuman being were only attacking the wicked where you have this the, and the the shift in theology that that job had was now satan is is attacking the righteous as well to test them and this this concept is further developed in in these other books like the books book of the watchers and jubilees the book of jubilees possibly drawing from passages such as first kings 22 where you have lying spirits leading people astray or leading people into conflict. Um, The book of Jubilees opens with the the first story, and this is 120. Um, The passage says, May a spirit of Belial not rule so as to trap them away from every proper path so that they may be destroyed from your presence. And then again, a couple chapters later, this is talking, um, this is uh, relating the story of Noah and the people being led astray. This is, Jubilees 7, 26, and 27. 
For I myself see that the demons have begun to lead you and your children astray, and now I fear regarding you that after I have died you will shed human blood on the earth, and that you yourselves will be obliterated from the surface of the earth. You have a shift happening here where it's more explicit that the source of, of men and women's immorality is from these demons or evil spirits. But interestingly, the Book of Enoch, another apocryphal book that deals with these watchers, these, these uh, demon spirits, when these B'nai Elohim bore children with the daughters of Adam, the, the children that were born were referred to as Nephilim, and they were the giants that are referred to in these stories. Later interpreters in the books of the, the book of the watchers that's part of the the apocryphal book of enoch they um, elaborate and expand on these ideas but there's a there's an interesting distinction between the way the book of enoch presents evil spirits and the way the book of jubilees does and it's it's directly in contrast where the book of jubilees presents these evil spirits as drawing the children of men towards evil the book of Enoch places the blame on mankind and says that mankind sought out these evil spirits and the blame or the source of their immorality or evil comes from themselves rather than an external source. All that to say, <laughs> in the space of a couple hundred years between the last books of the Old Testament and the, the composition of the books that would later become the New Testament, there was a lot of theological um, developments happening around this source of evil, this Satan figure, the devil, and what role he played, what role evil spirits played with mankind. So I'm going to read a brief passage from The Satan by Ryan E. Stokes, and this is in his conclusion, and it's kind of, um, it's, a, it's a good description of the way the devil is portrayed in the New Testament. The New Testament has much to say about the Satan. The Satan, or the devil, as he is called in the New Testament, is depicted most frequently in evil terms. He leads human into, humans into sin and is responsible for opposition to Christ and the churches. The Satan in these writings is a rebel who will eventually be judged. On the other hand, some New Testament texts preserve the earlier notion of the Satan as a functionary of God who physically attacks evildoers. Some New Testament authors also describe the Satan as one who persuades God to test the faithful with adversity. In an effort to characterize the threat that Satan poses to churches, two New Testament authors, Paul and John of Patmos, appropriate the image of the serpent from Genesis 3. The Satan, like the serpent, is the deceiver of the world who is out to harm God's people. Also, like the serpent, however, the Satan is ultimately destined for judgment. The way some New Testament scholars look at the depiction of Satan in the New Testament is encapsulating first century Jewish thought and the development of ideas around Satan in first century Judaism. In the New Testament, I'll just cite a couple of passages where, where Satan's powers are, are discussed. In John 8, 39 and 47, uh, Jesus uh, tells the people that are trying to destroy him or kill him that they're children of the devil, the father of lies, and that they're going, that they're doing what their father wants them to do. In 13.2, and this again is in the, in the Gospel of John, it's the devil who puts the idea into the heart of, Ju of Judas that he needs to betray Jesus. This evil influence is directly attributed to Satan as being the one who is influencing Judas to, to betray Jesus. But that's not the only ability or the only um, role that the New Testament Satan takes on. We have interesting stories like Luke 13. This is 10 through 17. And I'm not going to read all these. I'm just going to kind of describe them. Feel free to go and, and uh, look into it yourselves. But this is a story where um, there's a woman who is uh, who is ill. She has, she's suffering physically. And in this story, Satan is implicated when Jesus heals her. He's casting out an evil spirit and then her disability goes away. 
So this might harken back to some of these earliest ideas as of uh, the Satan being an executioner or an attacker. It does portray him him as having like a direct ability to influence people on the planet. You have interesting ideas again in Luke 11, 18 to 21, and then Acts 26 and 18, where they talk about God and Satan as ruling two opposing kingdoms or kind of splitting mankind into two different camps, one the children of God and others the children of the devil. Where none of this distinction existed in the texts of the Old Testament. These are all theological developments that happened during the New Testament time. In previous discussions, um, I said that the, the serpent from the Genesis story is not explicitly mentioned as being Satan or a Satan in the story itself. It isn't until New Testament writers put these words down that this sort of a correlation begins. And um, through the research I did, I couldn't find any other sources that might have said this earlier. If somebody knows of an earlier source than the New Testament that relates these two, please send it my way. I think that would be fascinating. But you have in the book of Romans 1620 and Revelations 129, where both of these passages mention Satan in connection with the serpent of, of the story of creation in Genesis. I'm going to read another passage from the book by Stokes here because I think it, uh, it explains um, an interesting practice that was done that uh, may have been the origin of this. He says, the identification or association of the Satan with the serpent of, in, of Genesis 3 in early Judaism should be understood within the context of other early Jewish interpretive retellings of Israel's sacred narratives. In the process of retelling and expanding their sacred stories, Jews imported the Satan or related figures into narratives from which they were originally absent. This practice can be observed already in the Hebrew scriptures. Although no Satan appears in the census story of 2 Samuel 24, the chronicler reworks the story so that it is a Satan who incites David to take the disastrous census of Israel. 1 Chronicles 21.1 The association of the Satan with the serpent who instigated humankind's initial lapse should be understood as another example of this interpretive practice. The serpent of Genesis 3 was one of several serpent traditions in the literature of early Judaism and was not the only serpent tradition with which the New Testament authors connect the Satan. A number of texts in the Hebrew scriptures speak of mythological primordial serpents and dragons. These include Leviathan, that's Israel, uh, Isaiah 27.1, Job 3.8, Rahab, Job 26.12 and 13, Psalms 89.11, Revelation's portrayal of the Satan as the dragon and the ancient serpent reflect such primordial serpent-dragon traditions. Many texts also refer to serpents, along with scorpions and lions, as typical of dangerous wild animals. It may have been that Jewish thinkers associated the Satan with serpents in general among other dangerous animals before they associated him with the serpent. And this is um, pages... 217 to 219. There's like long footnotes, so sometimes it's like <laughs> a small paragraph for a whole page. Anyway, please go out and get this book. It is such a fascinating read if you want to dive deeper into this subject because I'm I'm barely even scratching the surface. I'm gonna read the last three paragraphs of this book because I think it's a, a great way to kind of uh, wrap up these last three episodes that I've been doing about Satan. The way he's written this is just beautiful. So I just kind of want to I want to put it out there uh, for the listener to just kind of uh, soak it in and and try and understand exactly what he's he's saying here. So to preface it, Ryan Stokes leaves the book off at the end of the New Testament, and he doesn't dive any deeper into later developments in the beliefs around the Satan. In the in episode seventy four, uh, Kaisa and I did kind of an overview of some of the different views about Satan from other other writers, other um, theologians in this sphere. And we kind of talked a little bit about the inspiration that Joseph Smith might have had in his composition of the theology around the devil. Anyway, so this is this is how Stokes finishes off this book. And I, I just love it. He says, 
Beliefs about the Satan, of course, would continue to develop in the centuries that followed the composition of the New Testament. One could extend this project, could extend the project begun in this present volume, following the evolution of ideas about the Satan through the literature of the 2nd century CE and beyond. The Church Fathers, for instance, would speak of the Satan as one who leads people into moral and theological error, and as the one who is behind the persecution of the faithful. Rabbinic literature would depict the Satan as an accuser, a tempter, an adversary, and the angel of death. The Satan also features prominently in a number of pseudepigrapha, whose date and or provenance are uncertain. Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, Testament of Job, the Ascension of Isaiah. Both Jewish and Christian authors would continue to retell their sacred stories, inserting the Satan into narratives from which he was originally absent. Eventually, the question of the Satan's origin would arise. As long as the Satan was believed to be a functionary of God, there was no real need to account for his existence. As the balance shifted from understanding him as God's agent to regarding him as a superhuman rebel, However, an explanation for this evil figure's existence became more necessary. In order to provide such explanations, theologians created stories of the Satan's primordial fall. The history of beliefs around about the Satan is in actuality a history of beliefs about God, whether the Satan is a functionary of God or God's enemy. From ancient times until the present, this figure has served to explain the relationship between the Creator and the challenges of life as created human, human beings experience it. Belief in the Satan has accounted especially for the various evils that exist in a world that is supposed to be governed by a God who is good and just. The Satan has served to account for God's just retribution of sinners, as well as for the unjust suffering of those who are faithful to God. Belief in the Satan has explained the wickedness of the wicked, the Satan has also provided an explanation for the evil that taints even the hearts of those who consider themselves to be among God's people. It identifies the origin of these evils and offers hope that God will one day bring them to an end. Looking at the devil the way that we have over the last couple of episodes hopefully reframes it in your mind in a, in a similar way that it did mine, where it is an examination of trying to understand the origin of evil or the source of evil in this world and how it's this problem of evil, the problem that if this world is governed by a good and just God, why is there evil in it? Religion, Christianity, Judaism has tried to answer this question with this figure, the Satan. So I'll leave that up to the listener. Is the Satan a good answer to the problem of evil? Or is it insufficient? I think within the LDS faith, within Mormonism, whether you believe or not, I think Joseph Smith made some very interesting changes to the theology around Satan in an attempt to reconcile this problem of evil. Trying to address problems of people not, not being baptized before they pass away trying to ad address problems of the judgment of the wicked against the, the, the atrocities that these wicked people do. These questions were on the mind of Joseph Smith, if you're going to put him as the, the composer of the Book of Mormon and, and uh, the text in the Doctrine and Covenants. These questions were on his mind, and that's, that's what was being addressed with many of his theolo theological shifts around the afterlife. I think it's fascinating. I don't see what he did as much different than some of the writers of the New Testament, Old Testament, looking solely at him as the composer of scripture. I don't think what he was doing was much different than any of the other pseudepigraphical writers of the books of scripture that we already have. He was grappling with ideas around religion and he tried to put his own spin on it to reconcile some real problems that he saw. For the next couple of episodes, I'm going to shift tone. I'm going to shift the subject a little bit. It will be directly related to this, but not um, solely about the devil. I want to talk about the natural man a little bit. I mentioned where I was going with that idea in my chat with Kaisa. So maybe you're uh, <laughs> do a little reading of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to get you ready for that one. But that's coming up pretty quick here. I also had a recent interview with John DeLynn. I'm hoping to post that 
soon. And no, it wasn't a Mormon story of mine. We just covered some of the, some of my previous episodes. We covered the chat with uh, uh, Brian Harris from the church headquarters episodes uh, 56 to 58. So be on the lookout for that one as well. If this is, again, as I said at the outset, if this is content that you enjoy, if this is a podcast that you feel brings value, please leave a like, write a review, let other people know about it. I would greatly appreciate that. And as always, wherever you find yourself out there, sorting your kids' Halloween candy into a secret pile that you might want to eat later. (laughs) Yes, I just called myself out. I hope that you have an excellent day.